have 21 days between the end of last mission and the next mission. That is 21 days that will be spent um, doing pilot logs and things of that nature. But specifically, it is 21 days where Quinn and Covanon will be talking to each other. And they have a lot to say. Now, Fafner agreed that she would be Covanon with me. But at the time, when I originally wrote out the Covanon scenes between Quinn, I had assumed that nobody would get involved and that Quinn and Covanon would crash and burn. But instead, Bryn and Sylvia interfered and forced Quinn and Covanon to talk to each other uh, about kobolds, if you remember. And now they uh, are not going to crash and burn. Now, um, well, now, friends, it's about to get extremely gay. So buckle up, because Fafner didn't sign up for extremely gay. Fafner signed up for crash and burn. And I don't want to oblige her to role play uh, romantic scenes with me that actually progress towards actual romance. So I'm going to role play them myself. And um, if she is in, then this won't matter. And you'll hear that from her. But if she's not, then I have this as backup because these scenes still happen, whether or not Fefner will place Covanon with me. So here we go. The Boundless mission ended on October 7th. Um, Quinn and Covanon had a conversation where Covanon told her that she can't even remember what her parents looked like and that she's lost so much. And Quinn told her, well, you can be part of my family. She told her that the Hex Girls were her family. She explained how the Hex Girls are her family. And she told Covanon that the Hex Girls would be more than happy to be family with Covanon too. And Covanon asked Quinn what that would make them, what it would make Quinn and her, and what it would make Quinn and her if Covanon shares the same family as her is wives. But Quinn is too afraid to tell Covanon that it would effectively make them wives. So she told Covanon that it would make them whatever Covanon wants them to be. On 10-8 to 10-11, Slava has to go off on a mission. So Covanon and Quinn's next conversation is an argument because Covanon won't stop talking about war. And she's also increasingly anxious as those days without Slava continue to pass. And she's afraid that Slava has been killed. Quinn tries to comfort her and give her hope, but Kova doesn't take it well because she knows death is not kind and she feels patronized by Quinn's attempts to soothe her. Quinn pivots to distractions, read a book, browse the internet, and she's desperately coding, even though Slava told her not to do that. She just wants Kova to stop hurting. She tells Kova she'll keep an eye out for the people she cares about. And Kova understands the code in that, that statement that Quinn will find out if Slava's dead for her and tell her as soon as possible so please stop hurting. And that emotional support is better, but it's not comforting enough. And Kova couldn't publicly accept the comfort anyway, because she doesn't want Meliora knowing that she's growing more close to Quinn. It's a vulnerability that Meliora could use to manipulate her. So she tears into Quinn about how caring about people doesn't protect them from danger, and that all the give a fuck in the universe won't make death change its mind when it's decided it's somebody's time. She tells Quinn coldly that Quinn's never lost somebody like she has, and so Quinn doesn't know what it's like. And Quinn's reaction to that is to be utterly wrecked. And seeing Quinn's reaction to that, 
Cobain and can't help but soften a little. And she tells her that she prays Quinn never does experience loss the way she has, of course. On 10-12, Slava returns, and Kova rejoices, and she starts idly browsing the archives on Slava's advice because Quinn has got it set up now to where you can browse the old Earth archives. So Kovanen starts, you know, Wikipedia binging <laughs> through old Earth lore uh, during her hour-long breaks while she's on the Ike Soren when Slava's in port. Otherwise, she takes her breaks in her room and she reads Watership Down. And on 10-12, she calls Quinn first from the Ike Soren to tell her Slava survived and to thank her for her support. She also apologizes for her meanness, and she tells Quinn she's, you know, really, really sorry. Quinn tells her she forgives her and that she's not sure Kova can't be mean when she's on the clock because of all the prying eyes. And Kova agrees sourly and says that they can still find ways to talk about the things like they both like to talk about. And Quinn perks up and asks her what she'd like to talk about. Kova tells her she finished reading Watership Down. And they talk about the book. And ultimately what they do in talking about this book is they build this metaphor together, this reference together, that Watership Down is that peaceful, near zero suffering future where they can both be together as friends that they're fighting alongside each other for. So now, whenever they talk of Watership Down, they are speaking of that hope. And as that conversation ends and Quinn bids Kova farewell and ends the call on her end, Kova's left sitting there and Kova's starting to feel uncomfortable because she's feeling she wants something more than friendship with Quinn now. And that's scary because it's pretty clear to her that Quinn wants more than friendship with her too, just based on her behavior, but also based on what she said to her when she was trying to start back up conversations with her again. When Quinn told her she wanted to be real. Kovanen swallows at that memory and she closes her eyes and she tries to sleep, but it's hard to sleep because she's aching so much inside. And is this yearning? On 10.13 during the workday, the next day, Belius interrupts Kovanen at work and he invites her out to hang with him. She takes him up on the offer, but she's anxious because this is an hour she could have been, you know, spending talking to Quinn on the Ike Soren, and instead she's spending it like this. Still, she chats amicably with him because she knows Quinn will understand, and also she likes Elias, even though he's Meliora's personal bodyguard and one of her highest ranking generals. Because Velius doesn't seem fake about wanting to help people. In fact, He's come to her today for advice as he opens up this conversation with her uh, once they reach the flower gardens, telling her he wants her advice on something. My advice, General? <laughs> yes, Kovanen. And just Velius, please. Of course, Velius. Though I'm not certain how helpful the advice of a teenager will be to someone more than twice their age. Velius shakes his head. <laughs> Just because you're young doesn't mean I, or anyone else older than me for that matter, doesn't have anything to learn from you. I've already learned a lot from you, in fact. Kovanen looks to him. He's huge, over six feet tall, so she has to crane her head up to really look at him. Like what? Velius smiles warmly at her. And even though his leonine mouth is full of sharp, deadly teeth, it's a friendly and comforting smile. Like how you hold on to hope and keep hoping, even when everything seems doomed. Kovanen is stabbed by that. If only he knew how hopeless she's truly become. But he only knows the manufactured story of her. The Kovanen propaganda deliverance churns out, not the truth. Ah! You're speaking of my days as a scrappy revolutionary. <laughs> In those days, Velius, I wouldn't call what drove me to keep fighting that uphill battle hope. And she wouldn't call what 
what's keeping her going now, Hope, either. But that's not something she feels worth saying. What makes you say that? <laughs> well, comrade, she chuckles ruefully. <laughs> it's, uh, for a lack of a better word, easy to fight when you have no choice but to fight. When your choices are fight or die. Uh, but you didn't know if you could win or not. Humans have a fight or flight response just like Sussara, right? Why not run? <laughs> run? Where would that have gotten me? Of course I thought when the chances of winning were less than slim, Delius. Because those were battles where I had the luxury of weighing whether or not I could win. They were battles I had to fight. A lot of battles are like that, actually. You don't realize how inspirational and hopeful what you just said is, do you? <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess I don't. I guess I'm able to inspire hope even when I don't have much of it myself at times. Yeah. You do. When the shepherd's crook broke down, I assumed the worst. But you gave that speech about how breaking down is just an opportunity to look over the whole machine and fix everything that's broken so you come back even stronger. It was moving. I wondered for a long time, Kovanen, how you, just a 12-year-old girl when we happened upon you, had adults more than twice your age following your leadership on Dinhark. I thought maybe you were their mascot because, and I'm sorry for this, I projected an opinion I drew of you from what I know of you. But after that speech, I realized you really are a leader and a soldier, Kovanen. A comrade who I am honored to fight beside. Kovanen keeps her expression completely stony as Delius expresses the sentiment of being Kovanen with her. I see. Thank you, comrade. I, too, am honored to have such an ally in this fight. About that advice I needed from you, they're kind of naturally meandering towards the Aitsorin, and that stirs up some anxiety in Kovanen for many reasons. Seek it, and I shall do my best to provide it. Delius looks to the Ixorin. It's about Strava. Kovanen, you drew multitudes of desperate, malnourished civilians who'd never raised a gun or piloted a mech in their lives under your banner, and you honed them into ruthless, devastating soldiers in just months. They found hope in you, yes, but more importantly, they accepted your assistance. How do you get someone to accept help? Kovanen has wondered at how to get Slava to do better for herself, too. You can't. Kovanen aches inside. You can't get anyone to accept your help. In fact, if you try to force the issue, they'll often reject it even more forcefully and close their minds off to both you and any options you presented to them. They have to realize for themselves that the kindness you're extending to them isn't pity, and that taking it, let alone needing it, isn't an admission of weakness, but actually one of the strongest things they can do. And they can really only convince themselves, comrade. All you can do is encourage them to get through to themselves and permit themselves to have those kindnesses. She hurts inside because she just expressed the shy sentiment of key to Delius. So I just have to find the right message to say to her in hopes that it resonates enough that she'll say it to herself and convince herself. <laughs> well, Messages aren't just said, comrade. They can be shown or expressed a multitude of ways. But yes, be warned, though. There's no perfect combination of perfect words that'll guarantee a breakthrough, especially if the recipient is seeking to be insulted or offended. But, and her eyes widen as she says this, everyone is looking for the message. Someone just has to be the messenger. And it pierces into her to quote that, because it's 
almost word for word what Quinn told her what feels like an eternity ago. I see. Hmm. I'll keep talking to her then. Actually, would you mind coming with me and speaking to her now? Maybe two verse one will give us better odds. What do you say? <laughs> fight a good fight alongside a good comrade? I wouldn't be Covenant if I said no. So they do. They enter the Eidsworn, and together they try to find the right message to get to Zvala, that she's not the only person trying to save the galaxy, that she has an army of allies backing her up and supporting her, and she could have more allies even if she'd just allow them. And eventually, the conversation winds to this point, where Velia says, Svava, Kovinan and I, and so many other people who have joined the cause of Lawrence, are more than capable of carrying some of this load for you. You cannot be everywhere all at once. All we're asking is you delegate more. Oh, look, you two. I know you're right. But there's some things only I am uniquely equipped to handle. You know how the adage goes, Velius. If you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Covenant scoffs. Nah, I disagree. You don't have to do it yourself if you want it done right. In fact, you shouldn't. You have partners, Slava. Comrades who are willing and able to fight alongside you towards those common goals. You may be the person who knows how to do it best, but that doesn't mean you can or should do it alone. Slava looks at her really looks at her, and her ears toggle back some. Velius says, Svava, let us help you. Svava glances away from them both. I. Velius rumbles. I outrank you, you know, significantly. I could just make this an order, Lieutenant. <laughs> Svava barks out a laugh. Ha! <laughs> And she looks back at them with a fond expression on her face. All right, all right. I'll delegate some more to you, too. She looks from Velius to Kovanen, and suddenly her ears perk back up and her eyes glint. Actually, General, do you mind helping me with one of my ongoing projects right now? Velius laughs. <laughs> Of course, Svava, but just Velius, please. That rank thing was just a desperate bid to get through to you. <laughs> Svava fumbles herself. <laughs> sure, Velius, but it's actually your rank I need. Give Kovanen the rest of the night off. Kovanen's startled. What? Why? Svava grins ear to ear. Humble Lieutenant Svava Jur requires your unique assistance in something, Lieutenant Colonel Kovanen. Kovanen is put on edge by that. Svava's up to something. Velius laughs again. <laughs> Consider it done. Kovanen, you have the rest of the night off. Jody or I will take your calls. Please assist the good lieutenant in whatever she requires from you tonight as well. That's an order. Kovanen struggles not to stammer. Yes, sir. Velius stands and he rests a hand on her shoulder. And he bends in, and he whispers into her ear, in a volume only she can hear. Looks like we found the right message together. He squeezes her shoulder. Thank you, Kovanen. He straightens up and announces, in a volume they all can hear, Don't stay up too late. Getting enough rest is important. War isn't just fought in the flesh, you know. It's fought in the mind as well. Svava waves him off with a fond smile. Yes, yes, we've heard this before, Velius. We've heard it hundreds of times, easily. Kovanen nods in agreement. It's like your favorite thing to say, Velius. Oh, well, maybe I wouldn't have to say it so much if I didn't feel like it wasn't being heard. You have your orders, you two. Work on whatever it is you're going to work on to the best of your abilities and then get some rest. Kovanen looks at him intently and says, You're not going to ask what this mysterious project of hers is? <laughs> no, why would I? I trust you two implicitly. I know whatever you two are getting up to is in the best interests of deliverance. Speaking of, I should be on my way. He salutes them. 
and all things deliverance. Farewell for now. They both salute him back, and they repeat, and all things deliverance back to him. And Velius strides out of the Ixorin with a much more jaunty gait. Once she's certain that Velius is gone, and she finishes closing the hangar door, Slava turns to Kovenin and says, So, Kovenin anxiously replies, Yeah? When are you going to start taking your own advice? Kovenin swallows at the forming lump in her throat. Which advice? She's given a lot of advice today. You've got potential partners and, well, a potential partner lining up to help you. Is that something you're interested in? Or at least something you're willing to entertain? Kovanen's heart rate suddenly picks up. The partners? Plural? Sure, I'll accept them. The potential partner? S singular? I don't know. Well, you've got time to think on it, Kovanen. Probably all the time she can give you, which, if she's even a fraction of what she presents herself to be, is eternity. Slava moves over to Kovanen, and she rests a hand on Kovanen's shoulder as well. There's no pressure in eternity, kid. She squeezes Kovanen's shoulder. I'm gonna go get some rest. Give her a call. Kovanen swallows again. Yeah, I'll... I'll do my best, Slava. Slava grunts in approval and lopes off. Kovanen thinks back on all the advice she's given today. She realizes, well, she's just gotta find the right message to send to Quinn, right? So, she scours through Quinn's archives to find the right reference. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be enough to get through to her. She finds a file in the archive labeled Dank Memes. And she knows what memes are. They're actually an incredibly shy thing. But what is dank? She opens the folder and scrolls through just so many image memes, many with text on them. Things like, I want that twink obliterated, or I put on my robe and wizard hat, or I'm 12 and what is this? Just billions upon billions of memes and her brow furrows. She has no idea what any of these mean. But Quinn probably does because she recognizes them as dank, whatever that is. So she just has to find the one that does mean something to her. Well, to both of them, really. And oh, they're tagged. Wait, lesbian is a tag? She clicks the lesbian tag and the memes filter to just memes tagged lesbian by Quinn. And now Kovanen is hungry because Quinn has used the word lesbian with her a few times, with the implication that it was something Quinn is. Kovanen knows that lesbian is the word for women who are romantically interested in other women, which means she too is technically a lesbian. But does lesbian mean something more to Quinn? She stumbles across a solely text-based meme that declares that the moon is a lesbian, and she swallows, and she removes the lesbian tag and she filters by the moon tag, which, to her surprise, also exists. But she chuckles to herself. Of course it exists. Quinn is obviously an almost obsessively organized person, judging just from a cursory perusal of these archives that she painstakingly organized and tagged herself. Kovanen scrolls and scrolls, and finally, she finds it. She finds the right message. It's 2 a.m. now, technically uh, 10.14. Would Quinn even still be awake? She takes a chance. She gives Quinn a call. On 10.14, at 2 in the fucking morning, Quinn answers after just one ring. What is she even doing still awake? Isn't it like 4 or 5 a.m. on the flavor town? Quinn looks exhausted but she's visibly buzzing with excitement and amped up on adrenaline just to see her. And that stirs feelings up inside Kovanen. 
Quinn expresses a genuine elation that Covanon is calling her first and has been calling her first. And she asks her what she'd like to talk about, and she's practically squirming out of her skin in her excitement. Kova tells her she stumbled across a meme in her archives. Quinn is delighted Kova's browsing the archives, and she calls them the archives, not her archives, and Kova makes note of that. Quinn's doubly delighted that Kova wants to talk about memes, crowing that she loves memes. She grinningly declares that she sees herself as something of a memeologist, an expert on memes. And Kova laughs as Quinn demands, playfully pounding her fists on the arms of a ridiculous gamer chair, that Kova share the meme with her. She's so cute. Kova tells her the meme is of astronauts in front of, apparently, Old Earth's moon, where one is holding a gun to the back of the other's head. And Quinn chortles in glee and chants, Show me it! So Kova smiles and shares the meme with Quinn. In the meme, there's the moon, and it has a bunch of ghosts photoshopped onto it. It's just covered in ghosts. And the moon-facing astronaut is saying, Wait, it's all haunted? And the gun-holding astronaut is replying, Always has been. And Quinn laughs. Again, a full-chested laugh. And she tells her she knows the meme. She explains that this meme was originally both those astronauts looking at old Earth, but that this spin on that meme is actually a reference to another meme about the moon being haunted, where one speaker declares that the moon is haunted, and their listener replies, what? And then the first speaker cocks a gun and gives no further explanation beyond repeating that the moon is haunted as they rush off. Kova laughs. She says maybe old Earth humans would have understood the Ashai better if they buried memes within memes like this this often. And Quinn says that there are still memes being made by humans, especially online, and that people who made memes like, th like this one were called extremely online. And Kova remarks that they, meaning she and Quinn, are extremely online. But she means it in a literal way. And Quinn agrees. She says that she wants to get to a place with Kovanin where they're not online anymore. Where they can hang out in what extremely online people call meat space. She informs Kovanin that meat space is extremely online people's words for real life. And Kova... Uh, through this, like, while on the security of the Ikesorin, evasively replies that she wouldn't be opposed to that. And then they have a conversation about how the moon really is haunted, and how it is also a lesbian. But what they're doing in this conversation is talking about how they are haunted, and they are lesbians who like each other. And Quinn teaches Kova how to change her background, and she changes hers to Varna's moon, Ophiuchus. And she says with a laugh that she's a moon, establishing moon as a metaphor for a haunted lesbian who likes Kovanin. And Kovanin changes her background to Dinhark's moon, Ki, which, by the way, is also the name of the sun and the stars. They're all Ki. But she doesn't tell Quinn this because, you know, Quinn hasn't earned the right to learn terms yet. She does tell her it's a term in her language, though, which makes Quinn feel guilty because she's keeping the fact that she'll be meeting more shy soon secret from Kovanin. And then Kovanin tells her that she's coming around to the idea of being a moon herself, which is a coded way of saying that being a haunted lesbian who likes Quinn back isn't objectionable to her anymore. Quinn pounces on that, and she tells Kova about the Moon Rabbit legend. Are you familiar with the Moon Rabbit legend? Well, basically, <laughs> the Moon Rabbit legend depend it varies from culture to culture, but the version that, um, that Quinn tells Kova is this one, that the shadows on Earth's moon look like a rabbit or a hare, and that that rabbit is the companion of the moon, the moon goddess Changi, 
and it is constantly pounding the elixir of life for her. And that's it. That's the, the story that um, Quinn tells Coven and that the rabbit on the moon uh, mixes the elixir of life for Chang'e as, it, as her companion. So she's basically saying, you know, <laughs> I, you bring life to me, I bring life to you. That's not lost on Covanon. So, <laughs> Covanon responds after hearing that story, Watership down again. I'm seeking it too, dear. And in this statement, Covanon's coding towards something in the Ashai, which is known as Irrigan. Uh, and in saying this, she doubles down on Irrigan. Ugh. There's not enough female rabbits of note in Watership Down. Upsetting, all the focus is almost exclusively on the male rabbits. Ashai are essentially matriarchal, you know, so this is super dumb to me. And Quinn responds, <laughs> that's the patriarchy for you. It's a good book with great messaging, but yeah, no lesbians in Watership Down. And Kova meets eyes with her. There will be, she says. And this is her coding again. She's coding ear again. She's saying, I'm down for gunning to be girlfriends. And this floors Quinn, and it makes her blush. And she says, There better be, because they belong there. Which is, unknown to her, an undeniable expression of a different word amongst the Ashai that Quinn hasn't learned yet, called Sarak because she's implying she belongs with Kova. So she's raised the bid on Kova. Why be girlfriends when we can be soulmates? And Kova struggles with that because Sorak is big and scary, but it's something she's always wanted, even back when she was a little girl, before the war broke out. She used to daydream of finding her Sorak and just adventuring across the galaxy with her. And so she loses this game of gay chicken by responding, we'll see what we can do, which to her is a retreat back to Irrigan. But it gives Quinn that hope that Kova's not only warming up to the idea of loving her romantically, but considering doing something about it. And Kova ends the call blushing before Quinn can respond to her response. Quinn spends the next few hours after the call ends feverishly working on the matchmaker because if Kova is open to stating that she's warming up to the idea of starting an actual romantic relationship with her in an incomplete and not fully secure matchmaker, that means, well, now Quinn's ravenous to know what Kova will say in a completely secure system. Eventually, she gets too tired keep going. And she finally clears a spot in her pile of stuffed animals on her bed and she tries to go to sleep. But she struggles to sleep, tosses and turns. Because, you know, like any good lesbian, she begins to shred herself with doubt. What if Kova's just being nice to her? What if Kova isn't actually interested in her, interested in her? What if Kova just meant she's ready to accept she's a haunted lesbian when she told her she was coming around? to being a moon, and didn't intend to imply she was starting to like her. What if Kova didn't mean what Quinn thought she meant when she told her there would be lesbians at Watership Down? What if she just meant they both, as lesbians, would be at Watership Down as friends? Because Quinn originally established Watership Down as a friend thing, right? And Quinn doesn't understand that shy terms, like terms like this, update as associations go. Quinn aches with yearning. She swallows a lump in her throat. And she knows there's no denying this anymore. That this isn't an infatuation. It's not some silly teenage crush either. She closes her eyes and she rests out. I'm in love with her. 1014 continues and Svava has to leave because she's got a mission to go on. This means that when Quinn and Kova talk that night, they're going to be forced to have another regular conversation because that conversation will be happening through official deliverance channels. But Quinn needs to know for sure if Kova intended Moon to be sending the message she interpreted to mean, which is that Kova is not only gay, 
but likes her back. And Quinn desperately hopes this is the case. So she sets her background as key, Din Hark's moon, as a not-so-subtle message of, I'm here to be moons with you, which makes Cova sweat because they need to be subtle. So this conversation breaks down into a fight also because Kova goes back to war as that common context to chastise Quinn for being so loud about their developing mutual crush and how dangerous that is. But talking about war triggers Kova and it upsets Quinn to see Kova distressed and also she doesn't like being scolded for liking her even though she understands why. Quinn exasperatedly says again, that not every story has to be a war story. And then she angrily says that she'll be careful in her war, and she hopes Kova will be careful in hers as well. And she ends the call on her end, which leaves Kova with a lot to think on. And then they don't talk for three days, which is probably the longest they've gone without talking. Um, and they don't talk for three days largely because Slava's not back yet and Kova's too paranoid to call Quinn first when she's on the clock, and Quinn's not calling her because she's mad, and so she hyper-focuses on getting the matchmaker finished. And they start to miss each other. And during this time, Quinn reflects often on that argument as she works on the matchmaker, because that argument did confirm that Kova does like her back. But also that... Quinn just discouraged Kova from liking her because of her antics. And Quinn is anguished by this. It feels oppressive to not be able to express herself openly. She's not used to it. She rakes her hands through her hair. She's only going to be able to express her feelings for Kova when Kova's on the Ixorin. Otherwise, it'll always backfire. And Kova is clearly wrestling with liking her. Kova's not even in love with her yet the way she's in love with Kova. Kova's just fond of her. So Quinn has to think of a way to get through to her. On the 17th, Quinn gets ridiculously high, just blazed out of her mind because she's just doing some really unhealthy coping mechanisms and self-medicating just a bit, like a healthy person. And she calls up Lionel because Slava's busy. And she and Lionel have a conversation, which will be a completely different pilot log. But ultimately, the conversation boils down to Quinn asking Lionel what he would do for love. Like, what do you do for love? And Lionel's response is Lionel's response. But what Quinn interprets Lionel's response to mean is... You do whatever it takes. You do whatever it takes for love. And by the 18th, Quinn just can't handle it anymore. And she breaks down and almost calls Kovanin. But Kovanin actually also breaks down at roughly the same time and messages her first from that Juno account she made with a simple message of, you okay, and a half moon emoji where the moon is lit up on the right hand side. And Quinn, who is exhausted because she's been grinding away at the matchmaker for three days with barely any sleep, replies back to that email, I'm trying to be, and also a half moon emoji, but it's with the moon lit up on the left hand side, completing the moon, so to speak. And that message, that subtle communication, twists Kova up inside, and that causes Kova to start looking up messages again. Specifically, she starts looking up moons. And thanks to this repository of old earth lore she now has at her fingertips, Kova stumbles across a near perfect reference. And she's excited because she may just get to teach Quinn something new for once. She tries to keep focused at work and does her best to keep her mind from wandering or not display any of the excitement she's feeling as the anticipation for their next matchmaker conversation gnaws at her. And when Slava arrives that night and Kova takes her break and meets up with her, Slava just looks so run ragged that Kova puts her to bed and she calls up Quinn. And Quinn looks a little rough 
but she so has waited to see her, that Kova dismisses her worn look, settles in, and apologizes, and announces, Hey, guess what? I know what Pluto is. And Quinn blinks and tilts her head and says, What are you talking about? And Kova goes on to talk about Pluto, a planet in Earth's solar system. Um, that, well, it's not a planet anymore, Kova ad adds. Uh, Pluto was determined to be not a planet um, in the at some point in Earth's history because scientists realized that Pluto just didn't meet the scientific designations for being a planet anymore. And it became effectively a moon. And so she shares the information that she found about Pluto with Quinn and Quinn looks it over. And then Quinn responds, no, Pluto is not a moon, it's a planet. And she's really, really heated. Um, but here's the thing, this fight isn't an actual, like, angry, throw down, hull out, do or die fight. This is a play fight. This is a really playful, good natured fight where they're not really fighting over anything that they really care about. They're just fighting to fight because Kova thinks it's cute when Quinn gets angry. Or like this, not like when Quinn gets angry, angry, but once Quinn flares up at Pluto not being a moon, Kova thinks it's cute. Like the indignant Quinn is cute. And so Kova doubles down on Pluto being a moon and she just lists off all the scientific credentials for what constitutes a planet and why Pluto does not qualify. And Quinn gets angrier and angrier and she's really mad and huffy and she declares that it doesn't matter what science says, Pluto is not only a planet, but Pluto is now her favorite planet. <laughs> um, and then she, like they just argue back and forth about this, neither one budging, but it's just so good natured. And ultimately, Quinn tells Covenin, like in this really cute huffy way, that if she's going to be browsing the archives, she may as well look up more music. Check out like music from the 60s and 70s on there. And Kova laughs and she says that she will. And then she changes her background to Pluto. And she declares smugly that she's got a new moon as her background. And Quinn fumes adorably. And she changes her background to Dinhark, which is Kovanin's home planet. Now, Kovanin's home planet is very, very small, and it is inhabitable. It's a lush, beautiful planet, but it actually does barely meet the qualifications for being a planet, scientifically. And Quinn announces, oh yeah, we'll get a load of my moon, you jerk. Like as the, this, like, this doubling down of Pluto is a fucking planet, right? <laughs> Kova laughs. It doesn't even land on her poorly because they're in sync and she gets what Quinn is trying to say. But she does troll her back by complimenting her on her lovely moon, which only works Quinn up more and that delights Kovanin. But then in her heat, Quinn fires back. And she says, you're a lovely moon. And that's just a shredding crit. And it makes Kova flinch and stammer and end the call like a coward. On 1019, they talk about food again. Uh, they've had a food conversation before, if you recall, but it was very brief where they basically agreed that they would try each other's cuisines where, you know, Covanon would eat more fancy food and Quinn would try more junk food, you know, as a, as a form of bonding, right? If exploring each other's cuisines, whatever. Um, so they're talking about food again, because even though Slava is in port, uh, Kova doesn't always want to be taking her breaks with Slava while Slava's here because it risks drawing too much attention on either of them and it may lead to speculation that she and Slava's relationship is something more than just one that is, you know, their work friends. So in this second food conversation where Kova's on the clock, Kova's been working through a lot of feelings since, you know, that conversation about moons. And she's realized that, um, you know, she's been twisting herself into knots over the fact that she doesn't feel like she deserves love. And because that's what Quinn said when she said, you're a lovely moon. She basically said she loved her. So Kova doesn't feel that she's deserving of love. 
And also, Quinn is a fucking one percenter and a household name celebrity, and she's some mongrel from Denmark. So she feels that Quinn is extremely out of her league, and they shouldn't even be talking to each other, let alone falling in love. So again, she begins this conversation about food with a metaphor where she tells Quinn, I've been trying some fancier foods like I told you I would, which is, she's coded to say, I've been entertaining this idea of us as a thing. And Quinn responds, well, there'll be real fancy food at the Chamuel if you wish to sample it. Um, it's assuming you can show up, of course, which is her coding. I'm a fancy food you're trying? Okay, well, I'm going to be on the space colony in the flesh if you'd like to do something about that. <sighs> so, of note, um, everybody has been invited to a Halloween party on the space colony Chamuel. And the Hex Girls and a load of other VIPs are going to be there. And this is going to force Quinn to have to act as her old self. Her old self-absorbed Quinn Riesling self. In order to, you know, keep her parents and Meliora from catching on that she's changed as a person. And also to protect her found family, the Hex Girls, from bougie predation. Uh, she is the only one in the Hex Girls group, I believe, who understands how the 1% works and can navigate their complex social obstacle courses. So, um, Kovanen responds to what Quinn said with, Fancy food tastes good, but it feels too luxurious and inappropriate. Which is her coding, Look, I like you, but I am unworthy. You're a luxury, and I'm fucking trash. And Quinn just goes off on a tirade about how infuriating this mistaken belief too many people have that luxuries wouldn't be a thing in a more communist society is to her. She says that luxuries aren't a bad, forbidden, wasteful things that people have to earn. She makes air quotes when she says the word earn. But that they're good, enjoyable things that mend you spiritually that you are entitled to. She says pigging out on some hors d'oeuvres from time to time is a form of self-care. And then she bluntly says, I will be attending the party at the Chamwell, and you know everyone is invited, so it's not like you'd be unwelcome. Which is her screaming, okay, sure, maybe I am a luxury, whatever that fucking means, but you're allowed to have me. For fuck's sake, I want to be had by you. So come hang out with me in real life, you brat. And Kova blushes, and she says that while everyone might be invited to the party, that doesn't mean everyone can go, because she has a job to do. And she means this literally, as in she's telling Quinn, there's barriers to me getting there, right? So she's like, I don't not want to be there, just there's obstacles, like physical obstacles. And Quinn says, just ask for the day off. And Kova responds, well, she will if it'll shut Quinn up. And she's largely being this hostile so the spectators think they still don't like each other. And Quinn tells her that it will shut her up. And she angrily says that she's been trying junk food and she makes air quotes with the when she says the word junk like she told Kova she would and she loves it. And Kova snaps back with a very cold good for you and ends the call. But she knows what Quinn meant. She knows Quinn meant it both ways. That Quinn both loves junk food, but that she's also in love with her. And that's just more to stew and twist over. Because this is not okay. On 1020, Svava shows back up. And, um, oh, by the way, that argument uh, pisses Quinn off and sends her churning into the matchmaker again. But anyway, on 1020, Slava come, you know, is still here and she meets up with Kovanen and she tells her what the bleak horrors actually are. And just so you, the players, understand, the bleak horrors are actually a, uh, well, semi-sentient creature known as Garot. They're like cranium rats from Planescape, if you're familiar with that. Basically, the more their population is concentrated, the more intelligent and self-aware they become. And the more their population is concentrated, the more psionic they become. 
garat are psionic and they're sentient they're they're thinking people so she tells uh Kovanen that she and Velius are going to be doing a pronged attack on the Barat's planet where they're going to get as many of them as they can onto a bunch of ships at night and then get them the hell away from Deliverance so Deliverance stops using them as war machines now Svava informs Kova that Ark, the main character's leader, who is also Nimish, has been acting as a very begrudging and suspicious proxy between the Wulus and the Nimish, and that the Nimish have agreed to take the Garat refugees and house them on Nim. At this, Kova badgers Svava to talk to Freya, who is her ex-wife. And Svava says she can't just talk to her wife, she needs a proxy, and Ark won't talk to her because it risks exile. She tells Kovanen that Ark is barely talking to Velius, and she adds that she is not going to talk to her wife and risk getting her fucking exiled. And Kova strikes back and points out that Svava is calling Freya her wife, not her ex-wife, which actually makes Svava flinch. And Kova follows up by saying that the Ashai will take Freya in, just like they took Svava in. And in that moment of heightened emotionality, she loses herself in those emotions. And she overexposes herself when she says, be with the woman you love, Svava, because not all of us have that luxury. And Svava's eyes glint because she heard that. And she says, Rasha, not every luxury is as unobtainable as we've convinced ourselves they are. I'll try and find a proxy. Then she pointedly says, how's the matchmaker coming along? And Kovanen, who has just been called Rasha, reels at that counterattack and sputters defensively that she meant what she said for Svava and Svava alone and nobody else. She is not in love with anyone. And she was just trying to get through to Svava. And Svava smirks knowingly and says, well... Once the matchmaker is done, I can use it to safely talk to the women I love, right? And maybe other people in a similar situation could do so as well. And Kova blisters at that. She says she'll keep Slava updated and that she wishes her and those other people who definitely don't include her luck and tries to storm off. But Slava stops her, grabbing her and slamming her down to the pilot's chair of the Ixorn, and she buckles her in while she flails and protests as Svava calls Quinn. And Quinn answers, weary, hey Svava, what's up? But that's not Svava. That's a blushing and indignant, infuriated Kovanen. And Svava waves at her and says, have fun girls, and she leaves. And Kovanen doesn't even look at Quinn. She just wrestles furiously with the seatbelts. Are you okay? Are you? I'm trying to be. I want to be. Kova can't get these damnable things unattached because she's too worked up. So she sighs and she slumps and she looks at Quinn forlornly and she says, I'll try to. You look tired. And Quinn smiles and she says, so do you. And she changes her background to Dinhark. Hey, check out my moon. <laughs> my favorite moon, I think. Mine too. <laughs> no, your favorite moon is Pluto. And she changes her background to Pluto. And Quinn set off immediately. Pluto is a planet, my favorite planet, just like Dinhark is a planet and is your favorite planet. And Kova doubles down because Quinn is so cute. And she isn't thinking about what she's saying when she says, I'm Pluto. She's just trying to rile Quinn up more by being a brat. But she realizes in hindsight that she just accidentally coded a message when Quinn's eyes widen and she audibly gasps. And typical of Quinn, she pounces on that immediately. That's the hill you want to die on, Kova? That you're Pluto? Because you are. You are Pluto. And Kova's caught off guard by that. Oh, what do you mean? And Quinn says, uh, 
let me show you my moon. Hold on. And she starts browsing very quickly and she's visibly trembling and there are tears threatening her eyes. And Kova like lurches forward and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't dodge my question. I don't know what you think I coded at you. And Quinn says, I'm not, but you're about to. And she brings a moon up on her screen as she struggles to compose herself. She's visibly shaking. And Kova thinks to herself, what kind of message could she have sent Quinn that is causing this reaction? And it's stirring something inside of her to see it, to see that reaction. So she inspects this moon on Quinn's screen with, like, hunger. She's curious. I, I don't know that moon, Quinn says. Yes, you do, so to speak. <clears throat> this is Charon. It's Pluto's moon. Unlike other moons and their planets where the moon orbits and revolves around the planet as a satellite, Charon and Pluto orbit and revolve around each other in a stable gravity and they'll never part. If you're Pluto, I'm Charon. Kova reels. She blushes and she draws in a sharp breath. That is another undeniable expression of Serac from Quinn. Quinn may have just interpreted her bratty reply as an unspoken declaration of Serac. And Kovan and chokes out, D Dia, that's a lot. And Quinn watches her for a moment, visibly calculating. And she says, I know. Kova, I can play music to this thing now. Are you up for listening to a song with me? And Kovan breathes heavily. Her chest is hurting. Is Quinn backing off, or is she doubling down, or is she doing something else? But Kova says, sure. And Quinn loads up the song. She says, you have to accept it on your end to hear it, and offers it. Kova doesn't even read the title. She clicks accept so fast because she's hungry for whatever is about to come. It's gnawing her open. And a song starts to play. Kova leans back to listen to the song with her eyes locked on Quinn's. Laying back near the weeds well, that's why it stays. They don't think you matter because you don't have pretty wings. Her head tilts inquisitively and she leans forward slightly in her chair. And at this line, her eyes widen as the revelation hits her that not only did Quinn interpret her claim of being Pluto as an unspoken declaration of Serac, but that she's saying it back. And that tears into her, and a lump rises to her throat, and she has to fight back tears. Is this your voice? Yes, I covered it myself. Let them when? Uh, after the Let Pluto debate, I... Go. You picked it to be edgy, I suspect. Picked here. up on the metaphor of it being Dane next to meaningless and relegated just to be forgotten. But that's not what I saw. Are. Not for Pluto. And not for you. Kova's eyes widen again as Quinn says the word edge. Does she know what edged is? Does she understand braying? Kova averts her eyes from Quinn as Quinn says that last part, and she swallows again. Quinn immediately responds to her reaction, lurching for her controls to stop the song, which forces Kova to raise a shaky hand to stop her. Long before they said you were no more. Quinn called her out for being edged, so she must abide the pos and allow herself to be frayed. Sad excuse for a Quinn sunrise. looks at her uncertainly. It's she so opens her mouth to speak, here. but Kova desperately waves her hand to flag her to stop, and Quinn stops, just like she promised she would try to do. 
but she doesn't look happy about it. Let them think what and they it like. both We're Quinn's fine. honoring of her promise and I the miscommunication right shreds into Kova. Quinn really Once is here moon, to be real, moon, and she shouldn't be unhappy around. about her fraying. Kova's insides here, ache. It's the Quinn doesn't understand fraying. So it edge means something Promise else to Quinn. Me. She swallows at the lump in her throat and listens are. as she rasps out, I'm okay. As the song draws to a close, Quinn watches Kova anxiously, fidgeting. If Edge means something else to Quinn, then maybe the song means something else to her too. Kova's stomach lurches. She heard what Quinn said. It was undeniable. Does she understand it? Does she understand what she said? Can she mean it when she doesn't understand it? Is Quinn truly Sirach with her? Ah, I don't know. She doesn't know what she's saying. She's just crushing really hard. She doesn't know, so it doesn't count. Despite herself, Kova is visibly breathing heavily. And she hears Quinn ask, are you sure you're okay? Am I doing something wrong? Kova, I don't want to hurt you. And that shreds at her, and she flinches. As her throat constricts, she tries to assure her, but her voice just comes out as a strangled squawk, which causes Quinn to lunge forward in her chair and exclaim, K Kova! And Kova lashes out and disconnects the call abruptly and immediately buries herself in denial. Because long ago she determined she can't have Sorak, even though she wants it. At the other end of that conversation, Quinn realizes that there's a very real possibility that Kova does love her back. She's just not allowing herself to be in love with her. So Quinn has to convince her which means Quinn needs to learn how to speak to Kovanen in a language she understands. She needs to learn how to speak to Kovanen from the Ashai. Back on the Ixorin, Svalo looks in on Kovanen and she sees Kova's clearly in distress and she just silently lets her out of the chair. She doesn't say shit to her. She, and Kova does not say shit back to her as she flees. As Svava says, after Kovanen leaves, why does this have to be the challenge she decides to start running at? And she turns to her console, she pulls up her email, and she sends Kova an email that reads, you're running the wrong direction. Kovanen keeps running, and Quinn and Kova stop talking via the matchmaker again. And Kova goes back to talking about war as a common context in official channels and pissing Quinn off, which spirals her deeper and deeper into the matchmaker as she continues to fail to find a way to get through to Kovanen, and instead opts to grind herself into the dust trying to get the damn matchmaker set up fully so they can just talk freely. But on 1022, Quinn is just so tired of not talking to Kova anymore. And she decides to just go into the archive herself and look up war. At this point, she's just accepted she's not going to be able to talk to Kovanen about her feelings. And in turn, get Kovanen to, to, to acknowledge her own feelings. What she assumes to be Kovanen's own feelings. But what she can do is try and get Kovanen to get the fuck away from Deliverance. So she does more research to find a common context to get through to Kovan and what she wants to tell her. And you know that scene from The Fifth Element where Lilu researches war and then has a despair spiral that like crushes her spiritually and they, you know she just kind of has a breakdown? Well, a very similar scene plays out with Quinn, except instead of you know having a mental breakdown, Quinn's expression just gets more determined. She takes some notes, and then she calls up Kova, and she announces, as Kova picks up and says, This is Kovanen. Uh, 
hey, uh, default here. I'm having some technical difficulties, so there may be some interference. Can you hear me all right? Which is her saying, hey, I've done that thing where I scrambled, you know, our communications so anybody patching in won't hear anything but hellish noise. And is also her saying, so now nobody listening in will hear us. Can we real talk for a moment? Nicole Vannon responds, we'll make do, I suspect. What do you want this time? And what she's coding here is, that's lovely, and I'd love to talk real, right? But unfortunately, it's not that easy. And Diafold says, great. And what she's coding is, really? And then she says, fine. Have you read anything interesting lately? And she's decided, well, let's go obscure then. Do you want to talk about Watership Down? And Kovanen says, I've happened upon some interesting tales, but I haven't quite gotten to complete them. Which is her saying, you know I've read it all the way through, but we can't use that common context here. And Quinn says, ah, I hope you find time to do so. Which is her saying, well, that complicates things, but I'm staying on target. And Kovanen says, is there more you wanted to talk about? I do have other things to do today that are forefront on my mind. Which is her saying, be careful with whatever it is you want to try to say, because fucking with the feed here isn't enough. This is a duty of mine that I take seriously, though. And the code here is, I do want to talk, however. And Quinn says, yeah. There's more I want to talk about. I've been thinking, and I figured since you want to talk about war so bad, I'll talk about war with you today. And what she's coding is, you say what I've done isn't good enough, but yes, it is. Still, I'll be careful. And then Quinn says, back in antiquity, on old earth, there was a big war. They called it a world war. And this one was the second one. And this is her saying, here is the context I am introducing to you. And also information I'm giving you. Quinn continues, the United States, a country back then, that, in my opinion, had way too much undue influence on the world and history at the time, joined that war, but didn't have the manpower Say so they instituted a draft, a form of mandatory conscription. What she's saying here in the code is, Deliverance has way too much influence in this galaxy, and people, namely you, should have a choice in whether or not they fight for any interest, especially deliverances. But they put in exceptions, ostensibly to keep people who aren't suited for combat out, but it was largely abused by wealthy and individual people to keep themselves and the people they cared about from being drafted. Which is Quinn saying, especially since the who's who of deliverance aren't getting their hands dirty. Because, as I'm sure you're aware, those kinds of folks hate risking them and theirs, even though they're the ones who most benefit from things like this but they'll gladly throw people like you into the grinder. Which is Quinn saying that the who's who won't get their hands dirty, but those sure as fuck get your hands dirty. Anyway, after this war, that country started a bunch more. And this is Quinn saying deliverance is not going to stop. And one of those wars was so extremely unpopular that people started to protest it because they were fed up with fighting wars to benefit those people to the detriment of theirs. Are you familiar with this at all? And what she's saying is, but you know, you, you can, you can stop. Are you seeing the comparison here? And Kovana responds prickly, not really, no. And what she's saying here in the code is, okay, first, I actually am not familiar with these wars. Second, you are so wrong about what I'm doing here. And finally, it really is not that easy to just have conversations like this. Also, about that potential interference you mentioned, I'm not hearing it on my end. And what she's saying here is because there are flesh and blood people listening in. And Quinn maintains a steady expression. And she says, oh, good. I'm glad it's good on your end. And what she's saying is, oh, damn it, this sucks. But fine, 
If words are not a safe mutual context, then I'll just code differently. Uh, some of the music I sent you actually mentions it. Let's talk about it via the context of music. Is the code right? And Kovanen replies, Ah, I see. I listened to some of it. The song, Fortunate Son, is about that war you're mentioning then. And what she's saying here is, I recognize the introduced context of music and I understand what you were getting at earlier. However, I was curious as to what it was referring to. You know, to some people, this kind of stuff is contraband. And this is the code. I cannot talk to you about this in any kind of code and cannot even pretend I'm humoring you. That is how dangerous this is. And Quinn responds, Oh, is it? Well, piss. And what she's saying is, Fucking hell, it's that bad? I do not like this. I'm not used to things being off limits to me, so this is taking some getting used to, but I definitely don't want to get anyone in trouble, so I'll knock it off. And what she's saying is, I am so sorry. I accept I can't have the conversation I want to have with you here. I hope you enjoyed what you could listen to, though, she says, out of code. In, in code, she's saying, is there, there is something I need to say to you, though. Are you planning on visiting the shrines again soon? And what she's saying here is, can you meet up with Svava to get that message? And Kova responds, it was definitely music, but don't send me more. And what she's saying is, I acknowledge you'll leave a message for me. But do not talk to me about this on these channels again. Also, yes, I enjoy your music, though I can't admit that. And then Kovan and sucks in her teeth and says, And now that you mention it, it has been a while since I visited the shrines, and with the napping effect, it's as good a time as any to pay my respects to the our fallen. So I'll do that as soon as I can. And what she's telling Quinn in code is, I'm willing to hear whatever you have to say when Svala can get it to me. Quinn responds, Great. Say hello to your mother for me. And what she's saying is, thank you, give Svava my regards. Um, before you go, though, and here she's coding, there is something I want them, the listeners, to hear, though. Kavanaugh responds, make it quick. And what she's saying is, be careful. And Quinn says, I've looked into war a lot, Kova, and I can't say I'm a fan. And what she's saying is, I know you said no war talk, and I respect it, but Kova Deliverance fucking sucks, and I'm getting to my limit with them. Quinn continues, even when I look at it as somebody with something of a military background, someone from a military family, it's difficult to see the point of it. And what Quinn is saying is, Meliora is a bitch, and this is bullshit. Why are you even with them? Quinn continues. All that suffering at the expense of one nation or people for the prosperity of only a select few others of another and their people suffered for it too? It just seems so cruel. And what Quinn is saying is, you're not happy and that makes me unhappy. And she continues, why take things by force when you can just trade for it or something more amicable than that even? Look, I haven't run the numbers but the cost is probably less overall on all sides. What she's saying is, you can oppose Deliverance's fascism a million different ways, so why don't you just leave? And Kovanen responds, well, what you're doing with the Hex Girls isn't too different from war, dear fault. And what she's saying here is, you wanna talk about war, let's fucking talk about war. You're in this shit too. The people I fight beside want good for the galaxy. And she's saying here in code, I'm not with Deliverance, I'm with the Wulus. And yes, Deliverance does suck, but the Wulus don't. Kovanen says, out of code, I believe in that same goal, and I'm happy to swear my life to those ends. And what she's saying in code is, I've chosen to fight my battle my way, same as you've chosen to fight your battle your way. And now she speaks harshly. I'm not a fan of war either, though. In fact, I'm of the opinion that nobody should be a fan of war. And what she's saying here is, you think I'm not at my limit? And then Koba continues, and you're never going to really understand all the complexity of war just from study. 
and what she's saying is you not only don't get it but you are in over your head and coded within this war talk this exchange of Quinn not understanding war is also Covan and saying Quinn you don't understand love and you're in over your head and Quinn gets both those messages and her features pinch up in anger and she says then I'll just get more experience. And what she's saying is, I do understand love and I do understand war. I do get it and I am not in over my head. I can take this as in I can take the war and I can handle the love. I can understand the love. And Kovanen says, go ahead. You're not going to like it. And what she's saying here is, yes, you are over your head when it comes to war. You really do not know what you're doing. And no, you really do not understand love the way you're talking about it. Like, you cannot. Covan and signing off. And this is just a grow up. And also she does disconnect. And Quinn gets really mad. And she records a message and she sends it to Slava. And then Quinn and Kova are left to just stew on that for a few days until Slava shows up on the 25th. And she's really badly hurt. And, uh, you know, she sets Kova up with the message Quinn got to her. Now, Kovanen doesn't know how badly Slava is hurt until she meets up with her at the shrines. And she only goes to those shrines and meets up with Slava in the first place because she's promised Quinn she'd listen to whatever message she'd be sending. Um, also, she likes Slava. But once Kova meets up with Slava at, at the shrines and learns that Slava's injured, her whole demeanor changes. As Slava limps up to her, bandaged, clearly recovering from serious wounds. And Kova's shocked, but she can't really pry here. Her idiocy is putting other people's lives in danger. Slava invites her back for drinks on the Ike Swarm, and Kova agrees to drinks briefly and joins her on the Ike Swarm to both hear the message that Quinn sent her and hang out with Slava. Kovan and says, What happened to you, Slava? And Slava responds as she fiddles with the console. Oh, I got jumped. Bandit shot the engine out of the Exorn. Oh, I thought I was a goner. But some Nimish just happened to be passing through and they saved my tail. Fortuitous, nah? Huh? I thought things were weird between you and the Nimish. Uh, we're reconciling. Like I told you I would start doing. Speaking of reconciling, Slava ensures absolutely nobody not Kovanen is or could be listening in and loads up the message Quinn sent. Just press play. I'll be in my bunk. And she limps off to give her privacy. And Kovanen stops her. Wait, wait. Was Freya there? Are you two patching up? Kid, why don't you worry about your patching up and I'll worry about my patching up? You think I should patch up with her? As much as you think I should patch up with Freya, yes. Our association isn't like yours and Freya's. Slava side-eyes her and glowers. I can't be your only real friend in the universe, Kovanen. I ain't around enough, and I won't be around forever. But Quinn's more available and just as willing to be your friend. She's warrowing with you, I'm using the word right, yeah? So buy the past, damn it. And don't worry about old Slava. I'll be sticking around a while longer. It takes more than this to take me out. Okay, fine. But I'm holding you to that promise, Auntie. Thank you, Slava. I don't deserve you. Slava erupts. Shut the fuck up, kid! Everyone deserves me! Her fur prickles. She's really steamed. You know what? You two could learn some things from each other, and I... Just play the damn video! She leaves in a huff. Quinnon says, Fuck. And she plays the video. And here's the message that Quinn says Quinnon. Kova, I want to explain to you exactly what I learned in hopes that you'll finally accept that I really do get it. So about that war I mentioned, and actually basically about all wars ever, the folks at the top referred to in a lot of that contraband literature I've read as the ruling class, they got rid of the draft in response to those protests, but they still needed bodies. So they made it voluntary 
Well, and in the video message, Quinn makes air quotes, voluntary, and she drops her hands and continues. See, they predated on impoverished and desperate people, promising them relief and an escape from their squalid conditions. And then they made the economic situation in their country so obscene that they manufactured a massive population of poor and desperate people who would gladly sign up to serve for that promise of a better life. And in doing so, those desperate people powered the ruling class's war machine without any risk to the ruling class. <sighs> the ruling class ruined their lives, and then they broke every promise they made to them. They gave them no real support, and they didn't care about them at all, no matter how much they pretended to. And almost all wars have been this way, with the ruling class just churning up the desperate for their benefit without any risk to them and theirs, and with little to no benefit but all the risk to those people and their loved ones. And one day we'll be able to have a more serious talk about this because of that thing I'm inventing. And Swaggle will explain it to you as it progresses and once it's done. But for now, it'd mean a lot to me if you thought about everything I've said here. I would say stay safe, but it's impossible to be completely safe when opposing fascism. So instead, I'll say stay powerful. This message will self-delete and completely wipe itself now. We'll speak again, I hope. And then the message ends, and then it's just gone. Kavanaugh says aloud, She's smart, just not smart enough. She shakes her head and says, Never smart enough. She sighs again, and she goes to Slava's computer, which is loaded with less bugs, and she sends Quinn an email from her Juno account. The email reads, I spent a long time in thought after our last talk, and it occurred to me that military family and military service mean something different to someone like you, who comes from powerful expansionist empires, and someone like me, who comes from scrappy decolonized nations. That there's a difference between those who can make war a career, and to whom soldiering is voluntary, and to those whom war is a constant and soldiering is a necessity. To choose to fight versus having no choice but to fight. And we're not even approaching this on the same framework, Dia. And what she's saying here is you're choosing, you know, to fight for, you know, this war, the actual war they're in, but also for this love. And you're putting me in this place where I have no choice but to fight against your love, though I am choosing fight in the war. And then she goes to see Slava. Slava says, if you're going to talk, you better talk quick and you better talk smart because you got to get back to your post. And I don't have the patience for your self-deprecation. Do not trifle with me, kid. Kovana says, I'm sorry. Slava, I just don't see what I can possibly learn from her. She's incredibly sweet and kind. That much is clear. But she's so agonizingly naive. I don't understand how someone so well-educated could be so damn stupid. <sighs> Apology accepted, though I don't think you're apologizing for what I prefer you be apologizing for. Slava's fur raises along the nape of her neck. She ain't stupid, kid, but you're being dumb as fuck right now. She may be a sheltered, spoiled rich girl, but she's figured out the secret. I've been trying to drill into your damnably thick skull since you ended in with the woolies. She calms herself, smooths her fur. She knows value, kid. Her value and yours. And bless you, kid, but it wouldn't kill you to do the same. Know your value. In fact, I'm of the opinion that it's killing you to not be doing that. She lets that sit a moment. And more practically, kid... She knows how too many of those assholes at the top of the hierarchy think, and she can just walk among them and hear what they have to say in confidence and bend their ears. That's something useful. And Cobana responds, I see. Ugh. She cares about you, Covanan, and you should too. Care about you, that is. Whatever you want to feel for her is your business. How can she care about me when she doesn't even know who I am? Show her who you are, then! Oh, sure, Slava. Let me just go do that in front of all the goddamn cameras. We are working on a solution. 
You gonna cooperate with it when it's set up, or are you gonna make more excuses to reject its kindness? Cobana recoils. I. I. F fuck you, Svava! No, fuck you, Kovan, and you're rejecting my kindness, too. Everyone took everything away from you, didn't they? And it sure was fun for them. Wasn't. Was it fun for you? Is it fun now when you're doing it to yourself? She growls, her heckles raising. Think on that for a bit for me, would ya? Now get out of here before we erase suspicions. She manages to calm herself. I gotta go patrol the armpit of the galaxy now, but I'll be back with more messages for you if you'll receive them. Kovanen withers at her anger. She doesn't like Svava angry at her. Would it make you happy if I went along with the scheme and received these messages? What'll make me happy is you being happy for real for once in your damn life. So if the VR meetups and secret messages make you happy, then yeah, kid, I'll be happy if you go along with it. But if this won't make you happy, then you gotta tell me, cause I ain't interested in being party to your continued harassment. And don't worry about Quinn if that's the case. I'll get it through to her that you ain't interested and put her down gently for you. Which is Spava saying, you know, since you can't do it yourself if this is the case. Kovana crosses her arms across her chest. You keep calling her Quinn. And Svava is so over this. That's because it's her damn name, Rasha! I'm not any more fond of her than I am of you. She's a person too, you know. And Kovana blinks rapidly at Svava dropping that name again. I... I'll go along with this VR and messages scheme. She's not making me unhappy. Oh, great horned rat. Give me the strength. It's a start, kid. We're cool, okay? Run along. Thank you. She hurries off. Svava rubs at her face. What a mess. When Quinn reads that message from Coven and it just upsets her more. And she actually goes to Sylvia and she asks Sylvia to start training her how to physically fight. Because you'll never know when it might come in handy. And now Quinn knows that she's in many wars. And that she's going to have to fight for love. But she sits and wonders, looking at the struggle that Kovanen is going through. Whenever she expresses her feelings for her, she wonders if to do whatever it takes for love will mean giving it up. So she starts dialing it back and their next couple interactions, both on and off the Ike Soren, it becomes clear to Kovanen that Quinn is holding back. And Kova hates it. She hates knowing that Quinn is suppressing herself. And she can see the pain and discomfort it's causing her to keep her emotions and her feelings under wraps, to express them any less than 100%. And it tears at her. And everything in her, from every interaction, is screaming at her to just tell Quinn to say it. But Quinn doesn't know the term. And Kova can't bear the guilt of being around her. So, she starts cutting their conversations short, explaining away her need to go with busyness, and that just hurts her more. Ryland shows up on the Flavor Town. It's nice to see her again, all nine of her. And Ryland has shown up specifically to hook Quinn up with the uh, quote unquote technology Quinn needs to perfect the haptic feedback on the matchmaker. Ryland tells Quinn that with consent, this 
people will cause everything that occurs in the system to feel and seem nearly real. Like so frighteningly close to real or something virtual and simulated that it might be a little unnerving. And Quinn thanks her and tells her she's not even sure she'll need it anymore. And all the Rylands scowl. And she tells her that if she gives up on this, she, Ryland, will be very disappointed. Ryland says, Garot don't understand human stuff too well until they get into their heads. But that she, of all entities, understands the importance of finding someone that compliments you. And at that statement, all the Rylands nuzzle into each other and purr at each other. And Quinn sighs and asks Ryland what she would do. And all the Rylands shrug at once. And Ryland says that she would stop pussyfooting around with all the metaphors, references, and allegories and just say the damn words. And Quinn glumly says that she doesn't have Kova's words. And the Rylands ruffle her hair, and she says, then learn them from the Ashai, or use your words. Just say, I love you. And the Rylands quill about each other at that, and they smile and snuggle in on each other, cat piling. But Quinn is afraid. Quinn is afraid of pushing Kova too hard and losing her, and her fear compels her to continue to dial it back, to turn down the heat. But she only hesitates a moment before resolving herself to push even harder. She tells Ryland that she will find a way to segue into an explicit love confession, and Ryland says, don't overcomplicate it, just say it. And Quinn tells her she doesn't want it to seem forced. And Ryland sighs and wishes Quinn good luck.